few times we believe that there is one point, one thing about the ecology. Yay, go environment. I mean, if you ask anyone, are you in favor of the environment? What are they going to say? No, kill it all now. Right? That's. I mean, it's so simplistic. But if you're debating about what to do about ecological issues, you want to have a position that you can support that helps you either propose or oppose the motion that is consistent, that makes you look smart. And if you're aware of that philosophy as regards the ecology and the environment, that will help you discover more arguments. Right? So the reason you want to be aware of different ecological philosophies is so that you can use this philosophy to come up with arguments, you can use this philosophy to remain consistent, and you have an overall team line to use to try to convince the judge that you win the debate. I'm not going to tell you which of these ecological philosophies I support, or which youth should support. I think that's your decision to be made. But in a larger sense, the 21st ecological issues are, will, be, will be and are incredibly important for the 21st century. So I don't care if you use these in debate as much as you need to decide what your ecological philosophy is as a thinking, operating human being, and then act on that or change it as conditions change. Okay? So what I'm going to do is to talk to you about various ecological philosophical positions, give you the basis of this particular philosophy, and then talk about problems that exist. Or when someone advocates this, what are some criticisms that uh, uh, you could make? And I'm going to do them on a continuum, right? And the continuum on one side says, humans are important, we don't care about the ecology. And on the other side of the continuum you have, the heck with humans, we don't care, ecology is all. Right? So we have a continuum. So we're going to start on the side saying that humans are all important. Now I'm going to give you some troubling vocabulary words that you might find challenging, and I'm sorry about that, but that's what these things are called. Okay? And the first position I'm going to talk about is anthropocentrism. A N T H. R-O-P-O-C-E-N-T-R-I-S-M. Anthropocentrism. By anthro, we mean humans. So this philosophy is humans are all important. Right? This ecological philosophy says that human beings are the center of the, of the ethical system you should use when you're making decisions about what to do about the ecology. When human interests are at stake, that's what's really important. Okay? And that's what we need to do. So, for example, we can't deal with climate change, we have to protect jobs. We, okay, we need to chop down the rainforest, because uh, we need to grow more beef for more McDonald's hamburgers, right? We need to, uh, we can't do anything about climate change because we need to, we have lots of coal and we need to burn it, so let's burn lots of coal so we have cheap electricity. This philosophy says that human interests trump or are more important than uh, any other uh, consideration. <coughs> Many people have criticized this as a sort of human racism, right? Like the rest of the biosystem, we don't care, it's all about us, me, 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 human beings. In the family of life, the criticism is that human beings are considering they're the spoiled child, that no, me, I want everything, give it to me. I, you know, so human beings are acting as the spoiled child in the, in the, in the family of life. And the real problem with that is that human beings are not separate from the ecology. We're not separate from the ecology. 
we are, we, at first we need the ecology. You need air. You need water. You need food. Right? In order to survive. And the other thing is we are part of the ecology. Just like animals and insects and fish and everything and microorganisms that live on the earth, we live on the earth. And we are part of that cycle of life. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to question your religious beliefs as to where you think life was created and the world was created. But scientific evidence indicates that we evolved from animals. Right? So we are a part of the chain of life. And when we say only we're important, yeah, you may have a job, but you may have lung disease because you're breathing bad air. You may have an in, you may have cheap electricity, but you may li be living in a hothouse nightmare world where temperatures are high and the weather is all messed up, right? And so, you know, you may think that you're getting your benefits. Most of the benefits that the anthropocentrists think that they're getting are fairly short term. Right? I need a job now, I need money now, I need electricity now. But the ecology tends to be more long term. Right? It's, it, it, it changes more slowly uh, and it's not as immediate. But once it happens, it's hard to fix it. Once global warming really sets in, we're not going to go, oh, gee, we have to fix that. I'll use my global warming go away spray. Right? That's not going to work. Some people think there are technical solutions. I tend to disagree with them. But right, that's the story. Now, there are two kinds of anthropocentrism, strong and weak. Strong anthropocentrism is kind of what I've been talking about. Humans first, everything else, we don't care. Right? I think I've indicated why that could be a, a, a problem. But <clears throat> while some people have abandoned strong anthropocentrism, they embrace what we call weak anthropocentrism. Right? And here the idea is, yes, humans are first, but Ultimately, we recognize that humans need the ecosystem. And so we may want to change what we do in order to make sure that human beings have air, water, food, a climate that they can live in, soil that's not poisoned, right? So this weak anthropocentrism recognizes that people need the ecosystem so human needs and wants may have to be compromised in order to deliver a better well-being for humans. It's still about humans. It's all about humans. But at least it recognizes that humans need the ecosystem and live inside the ecosystem. Uh, now, the reason we have ecological problems now is because we have accepted strong anthropocentrism through most of our history. Um, if you look at some of our important documents, take the Bible, for example, right? God creates the world and then says to Adam and Eve, you have dominion over all of this. All of this is for you. You control all of this, right? And basically that's how we acted, especially during the Industrial Revolution when we said, okay, we're going to use natural resources in the environment to give us wealth and better standards of living. And so we ended up with, you know, coal covered cities and uh, the forests of Germany dying and uh, a lot of other things, right? So most of the problems we currently have are due to strong anthropocentrism. Weak anthropocentrism has only come since about the 1960s when we started to realize that humans were hurt by problems in the ecology. So it was okay to compromise human needs in one way so they wouldn't be hurt in other ways by pollution, um, etc. Okay. One of the advantages of making arguments from a weak anthropocentric 
position is that your audience understands it. Your audience understands it. No, we're not saying the ecosystem's not important. We're just saying that humans are more important and they need to work in harmony with the ecosystem so that we don't poison ourselves. Right? It's a, it's a system of evaluation and judgment that people can accept, that, 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 that makes sense to them. And you can make arguments like, okay, you know, this might lead to the extinction of certain animals, right? Certain species might go extinct, but what's more important, you or the frog? And obviously people will say, well, I'm more important, my family and I, we're more important than whether a few species die out, right? Or the argument that, well, species have been dying throughout history and everything's all cool. We just want to make sure that this species doesn't die out, right? Us, okay? So that's anthropocentrism, both strong and weak. And that's on the humans are everything side of the continuum. Let's move a little bit towards the middle. And this environmental philosophy, the next one is focused on private property. Private property. Here's the argument. Private property ownership is good for the ecology. Private property ownership is good for the ecology. If you own a piece of land, do you want to pollute it and destroy it? No. You want to keep it in good shape. It's something you own. If you own your house, do you want to wreck it? No, it's yours. You value it. It is your belonging. The argument here is the more private property we have, the more people own big sections of the ecosystem, the more likely we are to take care of it. Okay? This goes back to a famous essay from 1968 by a guy named Hardin, H-A-R-D-I-N. I say that because this might be useful for you. And he wrote a very interesting essay called The Tragedy of the Commons. And this is a phrase that if you use this, people will understand kind of what you're talking about. The Tragedy of the Commons. And he tells the story that in, in, in England, there were two kinds of fields. Excuse me? Yes. How do you spell the commons? Commons. C-O-M-M-O-N-S. Commons. Like what we have in common. Probably. Okay. What, I'm so glad you asked that question because you needed to know that and you were brave enough to ask it and that means you are smart. <laughs> You're going to understand stuff. Now those of you who are not understanding what I'm saying, you're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're stupid. Right, feel free to ask your question. H-A-R-D-I-N, Garrett Hardin. Here's the story. In England, there were two kinds of fields, in, in rural England, where a lot of people were raising sheep. Okay? There were two kinds of fields. There were private fields, and there were common fields. Right? And of course, your sheep need to eat grass. So, there are fields that you own, and then fields that are in common, everyone else. Now, one thing about sheep is that they, they have really good teeth. So they eat the grass very close to the ground. So if you have too much sheep grazing in a field, they can kill the grass. Okay? So, you're a sheep farmer. I'm gonna, you're going to send your sheep out to graze. Where do you send them? To the common field or to your private field? To the common field. Yeah, okay, let's eat this first, right? This is free. Are you worried if the, if the sheep overgraze and kill the grass? No, it doesn't belong to you. It's the common. Resources that are held in common by all people tend to be exploited more than resources that are private, okay? So, it makes sense from people's economic perspective to use common resources first. The argument here is that the answer to ecological problems is to turn it into private property. Here's an example. If the government of Brazil would sell big sections of the Amazon rainforest 
to corporations or people or whatever, then it would be taken care of. Right? Because people would not want to destroy it. They would want to keep its value. They would want to use it. Okay? And I'll just give you some examples of where this has been done. Okay? Uh, Honduras, a country in Central America. Uh, there's a, 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 a native people that are called the mosquitoes. Now they're not the insects that bite. They're, you know how it is, colonialists give bad names to native people. This is an example. I know there's one uh, native people in Chile who were named uh, after the Spanish term for poisonous snake. Right? So you not like them very well. But anyway, these are the mosquito people. Okay? And they live on the ocean and they fish. There's some islands and some reefs, and they've been fishing there for many, many hundreds of years. And they, everything was fun. Then with the rise of commercial fishing, a lot of these big factory fishing boats started coming to their fishing grounds and catching all the fish. So the fish stocks went down, right? And the ecology of those fishing areas declined because they caught all the fish. The other thing they tend to do with this kind of fishing is they put these huge drag nets and they pull up everything that's alive, right? And then they throw everything that they can't sell back. Of course, by that time it's dead, right? So they kill huge swaths of life from the ocean but only keep a few things and throw everything else back that's dead. So after a while, there's almost no life in these areas. So the, the mosquito people were like, uh, this is the problem. Now we're going to starve, right? We've been eating this fish and living off fishing for, all, for hundreds of years, and now you guys have screwed us. So what the United Nations did is they stepped in and designated these fishing grounds as a special economic zone that only the mosquito people could use. Only the mosquito people could use. Right now, after a few years, the fish came back. And the mosquito people were happy. But they also said, you know, there's a lot of fish there. We can make this work. So they made contracts with some commercial fishing companies to do a little commercial fishing there. And then they got money from it. There wasn't too much fishing. See, because they now owned this property, they could manage it and manage it so that they were benefited and it continued to be productive, right? Now, this is also true in the way, and, and I think a lot of the ecological problems we face are due to this fact that no one owns it. Now, does anyone own the air? No, no one owns the air. So, where is most of our pollution disposed of? Yeah. In the air, right? These big chimneys with the sulfur pollution coming out, right? Throw it out there. Nobody owns it. Let's use it up, right? So one of this approach is to have carbon trading permits, right? So the idea is what? Here's the minimum amount of CO2 we should put into the atmosphere, and every company gets a certain number of shares of how much CO2 they can put into the atmosphere. Now your company is very clean. You don't dump much CO2 in the atmosphere, but yours is pretty dirty. You need to dump a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. So it's cool for you. You don't need to install pollution control devices. You don't need to, right? Because you don't make that much. But you, you're dumping lots and lots of CO2. So you have a choice. You can either put in expensive pollution control devices to stop the CO2 that's coming out of your smokestacks, or you can buy her carbon that she's not using, right? So it creates a marketplace for carbon emission rights, right? So everybody does no more than they're supposed to. You either control it or you buy hers, and the result is you get overall control of CO2, you meet the targets you want, and it's the least cost solution. Let's say it's going to cost his company $100 million to control the CO2. But 
he can buy your excess carbon emission permits for $5 million. Deal. Right? We still meet, meet our targets for carbon emission, and it's the least cost method. I mean, if he has to spend $100 million to control the CO2, it's going to hurt his business, the prices of his products are going to go up, he's going to have to, you know, it's going to cost some people their jobs, it's going to be a problem. So this is an example of how the property approach can lead to control, but without costing so much. Yes, ma'am? Um, sir, can I just ask, uh, if, for example, I'm going to use the example to them, um, if uh, she sells her rights because she has more than uh, yeah, yeah. stage concentration, and uh, some new laws are implemented saying that uh, those countries have to lower the CO2 emission or some consequences uh -huh. will eventually be, uh, they can't cancel the contract, but she, how does she lower her CO2 emission if it's really low? I, anyway. Right, right. First, first, you would have, first what you would do is to create an ownership of the land. Of the, of the air, right? All the emissions that are going out from Serbia, right? Are, this This is how much we should, where Serbia can, can put out. That's this legal framework of how much emissions you can have. That's to come first. Then, every company gets a group of shares, right? And then, if she's not using it, she can sell it to him. So, it's not like the laws would change. But if the laws change, they would say, okay, we have to reduce fewer. So you would reallocate the amounts of coal so, so everybody would get less, right? But if she had extra, she could still sell them. See what I mean? Yeah, so the overall levels would come first, and then you operate within that. And then if the, if the overall levels were lowered, then you would have to adjust how many shares they got, how many carbon emission shares they got. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. All right, excellent. I hope, I, I hope so. Yes, sir? Uh, has this kind of system been implemented? And if so, yeah, uh, tradable uh, permits. Europe, Europe's already moving to it. Uh, wouldn't it hurt the market? I mean, wouldn't companies be more prone to going in a place that the emissions would be high so that they would? Why, well, yes, they will. Right? They might move to a country that's not establishing this. Right? And so, yes, this is happening in Europe. Some firms are leaving Europe because they can't afford to either meet the targets or buy the permits, so they want to leave. But you can do it through a lot of different ways, right? You can do it by using renewable electricity, you can do it, and in most cases, it costs less to buy a permit or control the, the CO2 than it does to pick up your whole factory and everyone and move to Libya, right? And so. There's also that factor. So, yeah, this rewards countries that say, we don't care, which we'll get to as another problem. Yes? Uh, so does this, like, CO2 exchange, if I can, if I can say, apply just to uh, the companies within the country, or also, like, countries between themselves? Well, the, 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 the object is that, I mean, the Kyoto Protocols established what each country is going to try to put out how much, you know, you get to spill out of the end of the air. But then how they organize it is up to them. In the U.S., it's been the government saying, you stop doing that. Control your pollution. You, and in other countries, they've used this exchangeable permit kind of approach, which seems to be more effective. Right? Because if I tell him, you have to spend $100 million, like, so screw this, I'm moving my factory to Mexico. Right? But if he can do it for $5 million by buying her permits, then he will stay. So different countries have done it differently. But, I mean, this tradable permit thing, a market-based approach to controlling ecological problems, is a, a very popular debating concept. Right? So, yeah, continue. Also, something else like... For example, um, if a company, like if she has, for example, if she, uh, her factory operates in UK and is in India, then for example, if, she, if they exchange the CO2 thing. That would only happen if there was a global marketplace. Yeah, yeah, and also for example, in India there will be like more CO2 release, and in India,
easier than, you know, the ozone. Uh -huh. And think that there would be like more holes. Well, so ozone is different from CO2. Yeah, but it's ozone is different from CO2. But in terms of CO2, so your factory in India, a lot of CO2 goes up in the air. Do you think it stays yeah, yeah. over India? No. It circulates rapidly around the world. The winds are always circulating air all over the world. That's why, you know, radiation from Fukushima that went in the air was detected in California. Or dust that blows off the Gobi Desert and is such a, a problem in Beijing in the summer. Uh, a lot of that will go out over the ocean and end up in California. So yeah, it's, but this is an example of how we live in an ecosystem, right? Where we're all connected to each other, which is the problem. That's why we probably need a global approach. For a private property approach to work, in terms of air pollution, it would have to be local. If it's just about where should we let the sheep eat the grass, it can probably be local, right? Because the resources are local. Okay, arguments against this. First, the focus is still on human value, not the value of the ecosystem. So damage that has already been done is not going to be fixed. Second, humans have a very short-term focus. Humans want to know about the now. Okay? They want to make profit now. So the market's not likely to be devised for long-term interests. Third, Human management skills are imperfect. Even when we try to do the right thing, we might not. We might not. And once the damage is done, like the Mosquito Indians are like, man, we need some more money. Let's sell another fishing contract. Yeah. So they have a meeting. We want money. Okay, let's sell another fishing contract. But they sell too many fishing contracts. And then they don't have enough fish for them to eat. And then when the fish are gone or there aren't very many left, do they reappear in one season? No, it takes 10 or 15 years for the fish to repopulate, right? Which is the problem that's happening in the Atlantic fishing zones now. Environmental philosophy number three, environmentalism. Environmentalism. Here's the argument. Humans must live in the environment. Humans must live in the environment. Thus, the large changes that occur in the environment due to humans are a problem. They are damaged. They have to be corrected. Current environmental mess needs to be fixed. It needs to be fixed first because of humans, but second, also, to help the environment. So you might think of this as extremely weak anthropocentrism, right? I mean, humans are still important, but humans only really need the environment. And so, and when there are environmental problems, they need to be fixed. This is the paradigm accepted by most current governments. When there is an environmental problem, pollution, your water tastes bad, your children start being born with birth defects, you're like, hey, what's going on? And then when that happens to people, they get mad, they get upset. When people get upset about pollution problems, they demand action from the government. Then the government acts, okay? First there's a problem, environmental crisis, people demand action, and the government moves to clean it up. Good example of this is in the early 1980s in the United States, there was a real problem of toxic waste had just been dumped on land or dumped in water. And so all of a sudden there were a lot of communities where the water was poisoned by strange chemicals and they didn't even know it. So all of a sudden people were getting really high rates of cancer, people were getting strange diseases, people couldn't Right? And it was a problem, mostly linked to the water because of this toxic waste dumps. But a company had had a piece of land, dumped a lot of poison there, and then left it abandoned. And then the company went out of business. So you have all these pockets of pollution all around the country, and what are you going to do? And people got very upset, and they demanded action. Right? We want policymakers to do something about it. So, 
they passed a law and they got a lot of money and they identified the 300 worst toxic waste dumps in America and allocated money to clean it up. Okay? So, now we're going to clean it up. So this is an example of how there's a problem, there's a political <coughs> demand to do something about it, and then the government does something about it. Likewise, I grew up in Los Angeles. When I was young, the smog from automobiles was terrible. The automobiles had, you know, smoke coming out of them. It was awful. Some days we were told at school we couldn't go outside for a recess because the air was too bad. We had to stay inside. And I had uh, asthma. I had kind of a lung disease. So I was really hurting living there. So then there was a demand. We have to do something about it. So California passed laws limiting the amount of pollution that a car could make. Right? Everybody had to go and have their car inspected to make sure that not too much smoke was coming out of it. And then the, the, the uh, air pollution started to get better. And over a period of 20 years, now it's not so bad. Right? So this is an example of environmental approach. There's a problem, public demands a solution, government acts to solve it. Okay? Any motion where you know, there's an environmental problem and the proposition team is stepping in, we're going to clean that up. That's what's happening. It's environmentalism. What's wrong with environmentalism? First, it never prevents. It never prevents. It rewards this cycle of first there's a problem, people die, then we do something. Right? It never prevents. Second, a lot of environmental damage can't be cleaned up. There's a super fun site where I live, one of these toxic waste sites that they're going to try to clean up, that lives near where I live, and they just can't. I mean, what do you do when millions of gallons of toxic waste has been dumped on land? Do you dig up all the land? Where do you put it? <laughs> right? Do you shoot in a rocket to the moon or something? I mean, if it's on the earth, where are you going to put it? Now, a lot of times the answer is you put the pollution where the poor people live. Right? That's one solution which happens all the time. Right? The worst, most polluting industries are put in poor neighborhoods because they won't complain too much and they're desperate for jobs and stuff like that. So you can't clean it all up. You can't just wave a magic wand and make it go away. In the case of the air pollution in Los Angeles, it took over 20 years for it to go down even a modest level, right? Because environmental stuff happens slow. Third, actions only take place when there are human interests. If it's killing the animals, if it's poisoning the oceans, if the humans aren't really concerned, then Nobody does anything. There's no political will to do this. Right? And so we might, all right, if it's killing the birds and killing the bugs, is it killing the humans? No. But it's probably going to kill the humans because they're part of the ecosystem. Right? We're part of the ecosystem. Now, DDT was a pest killer. It killed bugs. And they used to spray it on grain, fruits, vegetables, everything. Right? And it was very bad. And what happened is that the first place it showed up was in birds. Because the bugs get eaten by the birds. And then the birds keep all this DDT inside of them. So what happened is that first it made the birds weak. They didn't they didn't uh, reproduce as well. And when they did lay eggs, they had really thin shells, so they would break before the baby birds were ready to come out. And so the many of the birds in North America were on the way to going extinct. Right? And there was a very important <coughs> book put out called Silent Spring. Right? And it really, people were reading this in the 1960s and it had a huge effect on them. Because this was saying, look, we're not going to have bird songs anymore. The stuff we're using to kill insects from our, 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 our crops and our agriculture, 
are killing the birds and the insects, right? So the ecosystem might go bad, but by the time we realize it's hurting humans, we're in trouble, right? So, I mean, stuff happens before you notice. Four, environmental effects that do not concern humans get ignored. Loss of genetic diversity, right? Species start to die off. Well, you know, we don't need this species of frog. Or we don't need this species of bug or, okay? Have you noticed the news stories in the last couple of years, it was even on a Doctor Who episode, about certain insects that are, the number of them is rapidly declining, which is gonna have a serious effect on humans? The bees, exactly, the bees. Bees live in big colonies, right? And so all of a sudden, bees are being affected by something else in the ecosystem. They think it's a combination of a new virus as well as, as, as agricultural chemicals that are killing the bees. And so lots of bees have lost. If we don't have bees, we're screwed. Because the bees pollinate. I won't explain pollination to you. It's about sex. Uh, they pollinate all the other plants so that they grow. So now, in a lot of places in California where they grow fruits and nuts and stuff, they have to pay people to bring in thousands of colonies of bees, and then the bees fly around and pollinate, and then they take them away to somewhere else. It used to happen just naturally. Now it doesn't. Okay? Habitat loss. Habitat loss. Animals live in the natural world is the amount of surface area of planet Earth given over to the natural world going down. Our natural space is decreasing. Habitable places, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Why is that so? Pollution. Eh, what? Yeah, oh, uh, yeah, taking the land for human use, that's one. That's you, 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 you call that pollution. Chopping down to his face. And what else? Destroying forests. What? Deforestation, but also taking in wild, in the UK especially, taking in wild petros and bringing even any wild space and turning it into farms. Right, turning it into farms. Okay. All right. The other thing is just population growth. Populations are growing. So they need places to live. They need, they need, they need, they need cropland. They need etc. Okay. So lots of stuff is being used up. But it's not really linked. So animals need this habitat in which to live, right? Animals, can, animals and insects and other life forms have a hard time living where you live. Why? What do you do if you find a bunch of animals where you live? You kill them. Right? You kill them. Right, whether they're insects or lizards or whatever, you get rid of them, right? Oh, in many climates, you know, lizards are really good to have. They eat insects, uh, so you want to have, I mean, in Southeast Asia, you want to have geckos living around your house because they eat, eat the bad insects. But, yeah, you kill them, so they go away. Who cares? Who cares about those animals? We don't need those animals. The point is that species are part of the web of life. And when the web of life breaks apart, right, through species loss, at some point, the ecosystem will collapse. The ecosystem will collapse. Now, I know that doesn't make sense, so I'm gonna give you an analogy. Paul Ehrlich, who's a leading ecological scholar, puts it this way, okay? You're flying in an airplane. You look out the window and you see one of the rivets that holds the wing on pops out. Are you gonna crash? No, there are other rivets holding the wing in, right? So all of a sudden you see another rivet pop out. Are you gonna crash? Uh, probably not. But at some point, one of the rivets falls off, the wing collapses, and you crash to the ground. And that's exactly how it is with an ecosystem. 
An ecosystem will survive a lot of stresses, but at some point, right, if the parts of it are lost, if the species of it are lost, then you're in trouble. And the species are related to each other. Okay, insects eat microorganisms. What eats insects? Birds. Birds, lizards, lizards fish, all kinds of stuff. Who eats birds, lizards, fish? Higher predators, right? Who eats, high, who eats higher animals? We do. <laughs> well, we eat all kinds of animals, right? And so at some point, the ecosystem drops out. One of the most important elements of the ecosystem are the insects are the insects. They're absolutely important. Right? If the insects go, we're screwed. Ozone layer. Here's one reason why the ozone layer is incredibly important. If we lose the ozone layer and these ultraviolet rays come through strongly, the vast majority of insects will go blind. Their eyes will be burned out by the ultraviolet rays. And when the insects go blind, the rest of us are in deep, deep trouble. Because we need those insects. Right? You know that a huge amount of, uh, I mean, termites are very important for global warming. Termites dispose of a huge amount of CO2 in their natural activities. Right? And so if termites went away, oh my goodness, we'd be in deep trouble. Okay? The last thing I want to say about this environmentalism is just what I think you've been saying, that action tends not to be taken when it's a multinational thing, right? When it's a multinational thing where pollution flows away from you, right? Like all these factories in the American Midwest spewed all this sulfur pollution, but the wind blew it over Canada, and then it destroyed the Canadian forest, and we're like, well, you know, not our problem. Right? But finally, Canada and the U.S. had to work out a multinational approach to solve this acid rain issue. Right? So, you know, stuff flows away from you. If nobody in the Midwest said, oh, our policymakers must do something about acid rain, I don't care about it. It's mm -hmm. destroying, you know, forests and lakes and fish in Canada. Ha ha. Right? So, so this is a problem. And, we, as we saw from our CO2 example, the world is one ecosystem, so everything flows somewhere else. In Jamaica, I was there, I said, how come we have such great, everybody here's clothes are so white. I don't think any, very many people have washing machines, but their clothes are so white. And they're like, oh yeah, we use the special detergents that have chemicals that are banned in all other countries that make our clothes really white. But we don't really care because it gets in the water and it runs into the ocean. But it goes somewhere, right? Everything goes somewhere. So this is an issue of that. Next philosophy, shallow ecology. Shallow ecology. Now nobody's gonna call this, we advocate shallow ecology, right? They might just call it ecology. The focus here is on individual responsibility and changing lifestyles. Consumers are encouraged to go green by recycling, using eco-friendly products, not driving so much, right? Live simply so that others may simply live. Notice how the focus is still on humans, right? And what we need to do is to educate consumers or pass laws to get them to change their behaviors and make them more eco-friendly and that this will solve our ecological problems. Mandatory recycling, don't drive so much, right? Carpools, uh, use, a bi use bikes one day a week, all of this kind of stuff, right? We need to change individual behavior and this will do it for us, okay? Here are arguments against this. First, many eco-friendly products are not really eco-friendly. They may be advertised as being better, <laughs> better, but not necessarily really, really eco-friendly. And I want to take an example from food, okay? 
People in America were very concerned, concerned that a lot of foods had too much fat in them. Too fat, making them fat, too much fat in convenience foods and snack foods. So they all of a sudden, many snacks became low fat. Low fat snacks. And go, oh, I'll eat low fat snacks. But they didn't taste very good. So to make them taste better, they put more sugar in them. So they're still really bad for your health, but it has low fat. So everybody's like, yay, I'm eating low fat now, sugar, sugar, sugar. Right? So, I mean, and if you're trying to sell a product, don't you want to say that it's eco-friendly? And if it's less eco-damaging than a previous product, I guess it is more eco-friendly. But is it eco-friendly enough to really make a difference? Probably not. Second, most industrial and production processes are hidden. This is where most of the pollution takes place, not in the consumption, not in the use of products, but in the way they're created. This is hidden. All of these continue to happen. Making cars creates a lot of pollution. Making cars. Driving your car one less day a week doesn't do anything about the pollution created when you make a car. See what I mean? Right? You may recycle your trash, but you're still making all this crap. All the excess packaging, all the plastic waste, all of that, right, still gets made. So the majority of environmental damage comes in the production. And shallow ecology ignores that to just talk about consumer end use. Third. Small action by consumers stops them from demanding more serious action, which is what they really, we really need. Small action by consumers stops them from demanding more serious action, which is what we really need. This is called demobilization. Oh, I don't need to worry about the environment. I recycle my trash. Oh, I'm environmentally friendly. I ride a bike once a week. So people think, now, we saw under environmentalism, when will government act to do anything? Yeah, when there's a lot of pressure, right? When voters are demanding it. This stops people from demanding ecological reform. Because I'm living, I'm, I'm green, I'm eco-friendly. So, so it's not my fault. I use eco-friendly plastic bags, right? But there's still bags full of crap that's hurting the environment that you're using, right? And just because you recycle, right, only a small part of the trash that gets recycled actually gets used over again. So you think you're recycling all your trash, you're recycling about 15%. So, big deal. Still, you have to dump it and bury it somewhere, and the poisons get into the water, and your grandchildren are poisoned. Fourth, it doesn't correct previous ecological damage. It does nothing about the ecological damage that's already taken place. Nothing. Finally, people still keep this consumerist mindset that what I need to be happy is to buy products. I need, I need to buy stuff. And if I buy, and if I have stuff, then that makes me happy. It doesn't change the mindset because really, stuff doesn't make you happy. Right? And I have a whole separate lecture on what makes you happy. And stuff doesn't make you happy. Now, somebody has tried to convince you that stuff makes you happy. Who wants to convince you that stuff makes you happy? Corporations. Who make stuff? Yeah. <laughs> right. Right? What really makes you happy? Friends? Family? Right? Meaningful work, hobbies, creativity, singing, dancing, all those things that you can do kind of for free. Right? Those don't cost any money. You don't need, you don't need an iPhone to sing and dance. You can do that. Now, you must. You have to have a karaoke machine. Ooh. What, whatever. Whatever. That's my symbol for I don't care. W. Whatever. Next, deep ecology. Deep ecology. This one's pretty funky. 
Established by the Norwegian philosopher Arne Nees and George Sessions in the late 1980s, there are eight tenets of deep ecology. And I have four minutes to explain them. I have seven minutes to explain them. Number one, the well-being and flourishing of human and non-human life. All life has inherent value. All life has inherent value. Your life is valuable. Your child's life is valuable. That animal's life is valuable. All life has value. Okay. Second, diversity of life is important. Diversity of life is important. We don't want to have one kind of insect. We need many kinds of insects. We don't want to have one kind of cow. We need to have many, many kinds of cows. Why is it important to have many kinds of cows instead of just one kind of cow? Tell them. All the different place in the environment? They probably have different effects on the environment, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. What if there's a disease that affects this one kind of cow? And then all our cows die and that's it? Right? We're in trouble. Diversity prevents this. <coughs> Diversity makes the, the ecosystem more robust, stronger. Right? How many rivets do you want holding the wing on? As many as possible to stop the crash. Okay? Third, humans have no right to reduce the richness and diversity of life, except to satisfy vital needs. Humans have no right to reduce the richness and diversity of life, except to satisfy vital needs. If you lived on an island, and the last dodo bird was there, and you were starving, would you kill it? Yeah, they would say, yeah, right? If you needed to survive, you can do it for your vital needs. But most of the things we do for the environment are not for our vital needs, right? It's so we can have stuff. It's so we can have more, right? If something's absolutely essential, then it's okay to compromise the ecosystem. But if you don't really need it, humans have no right to do this. If you don't have a right, to plunder the ecosystem so you can get rich. You don't have a right to plunder the ecosystem because it makes you feel powerful. You don't have the right to plunder the ecosystem for some selfish reason of your own. Right? Like uh, Chinese medicine is a perfect example. Right? Traditional Chinese medicine says that you know certain things will give you certain powers. So Tigers are really threatened. You know why? Because Chinese medicine wants their penises. Kill all the tigers, chop their penis off, and you can sell it for huge amounts of money so that it gets sold in the marketplace in Hong Kong for men who feel it's going to make them better. Right? That's not justified. Four, the flourishing of human life is compatible with a smaller population. Human life can flourish with a smaller population. And non-human life flourishes more when there are less people. We have too many people. It's threatening the richness and diversity of non-human life. We need a smaller population. It will be OK with a smaller population. Five. Present human interference in the non-human world is excessive. Things are getting worse. Humans are destroying the ecosystem. They're doing it faster. Things are getting worse. Six, policies must be changed. Economic, technological, ideology policies must change. The changes will result in a very different world. Seven. These changes must result in an appreciation of life quality rather than quantity. 
Quality needs to become more important than quality, than quantity. Quality, where we live together in situations of inherent value, right? Where we're healthy, where we're, but not as many of us, where we don't have everything we want, but we have what we need. It's more important than quantity. I want more and more stuff, <coughs> right? And this is seen in economic growth. We need enough so that a smaller number of humans can live a quality life, but they're not going to be able to have all the stuff they need. Everybody should have a place to live. That doesn't mean they need a five-bedroom house. Everybody should be able to move around in their community. It doesn't mean they need two big cars. See what I mean? We need to have quality of life, not quantity of life. Eight, those who subscribe to these ideas have an obligation, an ethical imperative to try to implement these changes. If you believe that this is true, you have an ethical obligation to do that. Okay? This is deep ecology. Problems in deep ecology are as follows. First, oh, first, humans, it's entirely natural for humans to put their needs first. I bet dogs put their needs first. I bet bees put their needs first. Humans put their needs first. How are you going to change human beings from putting their needs first? You're probably not. Second, many creatures change the environment. Humans change the environment. It's part of what we do. We change the environment. Do termites create their own environment? Yeah. Do beavers build their lodge? Yeah. The problem is that we just go a little too far. Right? So it's not that we're especially evil. We just do some things that need to be controlled. Third, this approach requires a vast decrease in population. Several billion people need to go. And who will that be? Any volunteers? Maybe we'll pick countries we don't like. Or maybe we'll decide that the poor or the rich are the ones that need to go. How do you go about getting rid of billions of people without committing horrible atrocities and unbelievable crimes? Four. This usually works pretty well for the rich but not for the poor, right? If you're a person in Bangladesh, you know, going to, oh, sorry, economic growth has to stop. It's bad for the environment. Of course, those people who are already well off will say that. How do you stop the more than a billion people who live on less than a dollar a day from wanting economic growth? It's one thing to say economic growth bad, but some people have too much, some people have not enough. How do you fix that? Right? People in power are not going to go for that. And if you tell people not in power, the poor, sorry, you can't have economic growth, they're not going to go for that. Right? So it's incredibly a problem. Five. This approach romanticizes primitive lifestyles. Oh, we'll just live in a little cottage in the forest and we'll have a garden, and a couple of sheep, and then we'll live that way. Great. That sounds nice. What, but what, what, what are you going to do when you need to go to the hospital? <laughs> well, we, where will your electricity come from? What, what do you do when the wind doesn't blow for your windmill? Right? This says, oh, let's live a simpler, more traditional lifestyle. I think it's a little too late for that. Right? It's really impractical. Finally, and this is huge, this tends to ignore the role that technology will play. A lot of these problems that exist will have technological solutions. If you want to read one book that will help you understand a critique of deep ecology and many ecological viewpoints, it's called Abundance. By who? By Diamandis. D-I-A-M-A-N-D-I-S. Diamandis. Fabulous book. It's so good, I'm making all my debaters read it, and I bought a copy for Boyan. Because it says that new technology, new forms of organization, new strategies for how humans can interact with the environment are going to solve a lot of these problems. Okay? So, yeah, what about technology, big boy? Alright, the final one is very easy. It's called Extremely Deep Ecology. 
extremely deep ecology. Here it is. Humans are a virus that infects planet Earth. The only way to save planet Earth is to get rid of humans. Then the world can heal and move on to become something better. Last 30 seconds. Close the door. Thank you. Get rid of the humans. They're the ones who are causing all the problems. Human extinction would be a good thing. And in fact, the only thing that could save the Earth. Obviously, I think there are problems with this ecological approach, like you have to die, your children and your friends all have to die. So uh, I think that there might be. So I think saying, on one end, humans are the only thing that matter. And on the other end, saying, humans are the worst things, we need to get rid of them. I think the answer is somewhere in the middle. And you need to look there. When you do in a debate, you identify which perspective the opponent's taking, what's wrong with their ecological philosophy, which one can I embrace in competition, and then you're good to go. It will help you think of arguments, it will help you think of what's wrong with their position, and it will help you a lot. Okay? Extreme ecology, a bit hypocritical. I mean, no, deeply. I mean, it's a, every, everything's hypothetical. Hypocritical. Oh, hypocritical. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's very critical of existing systems. Yeah. It says this current stuff's got to change. I agree, but I think the changes probably need to occur in ways that they're not imagining, like through technology and human organization. But that's just me. I want you to make your own decision. Okay. Thank you very much.